Hi, hi, I'm Michael. I'm a business owner, entrepreneur, investor, so so funny improv artist, speaker, which is a new one for anyone listening. I haven't put that in here before. I did a seminar last week and I think I got the bug. So we'll see if I keep going with that. But as always, I'm very, very neurotic. I'm also a TV host and I'm your host right now for what we call the Second Scene Podcast. It is a Dweebs Global production where you can get free resume help, mental health assistance, you name it, everything in between. Totally free, totally confidential. We have uh, mentors from around the world. So dweebsglobal.org. So I'm here today with Steve Gimbel. Steve is a man of many talents and scenes. He's a professor of philosophy at Gettysburg College. He has written two books on the life, science, and religion of Albert Einstein. He is a stand-up comedian, and he teaches a class called Take My Course, Please, The Philosophy of Humor. His seminars are uber popular and are another level of entertainment. I personally reached out to Steve after my sister's mother-in-law saw him speak and couldn't say enough great things about him. And as a side note, Steve and I now call her uh, uh, the Smaltimore because there should be a formal name for sister's mother-in-law. So my Smaltimore couldn't say enough good things about you. <laughs> so thanks for being here, Steve. Oh, my pleasure. Glad to join you. <laughs> so I guess right off the bat, uh, philosophy of humor like what makes something funny is uh i'm just going to dive right into that that's perfectly fair and it's it's actually amongst philosophers a point of contention uh so what's interesting is philosophers aren't necessarily funny yet a number of them love humor and there's nothing we won't analyze to death and so groups of us get together now the the standard line that most people take is that what makes something funny is an incongruity. That is when two things don't fit together, but then we put them together. Think Laurel and Hardy, big guy, skinny guy, right? Uh, a joke, set up, leads you to think one way, punchline makes you think another way. And so it's, it's when things don't fit and the mind has to work and try to figure out this puzzle. And then there's suddenly that aha, right? That moment where you get the joke and the mind can relax and realize, oh, I see what's happening. So that's sort of the standard view. Right. The, I, I connect okay. with that a lot, because with, with the improv, it's all about, the, or a lot of, some people say it's all about the game. And a lot of times the game starts because something odd will happen, something that you're not really expecting to be like a personality trait or something somebody that's says. exactly right. In fact, I use improv comedy as one of my major counterexamples to that move because what their view is, is it's the incongruity that's funny. Whereas when you do improv, what's wonderful is you start with the incongruity. It's not funny yet, but it's when the actors actually make it fit, that's where the humor comes in. So my view, which is very much unorthodox in the philosophy of humor community, is that it's cleverness. And that incongruities can be clever, but at times congruity can be clever. So if you take somebody who does impersonation, right? The, you, know, you know that this person is not the voice that they're doing, but the fact that they do it so perfectly is what makes it funny. So for me, I think the answer what makes something funny is that there's an inherent cleverness to it. And why is, that, why, why is that a point of contention? Why are you a, an outliner, an, an outsider in, in the philosophy community <laughs> for saying this? Well, a lot of philosophers love to reduce things to an inherent logic. And the nice thing about the incongruity view is that there is this structure that we can hang all of humor on. And what I wanna argue is, no, that's not the only structure we can use. And the fact that I'm blowing up the nice, easy explanation <laughs> makes people angry. <laughs> they, they want it more sim more simplified <laughs> well is clever and easily i don't want to say diagnosed but that's not the right word is it, oh. clever is kind of like, so very broad like that's a, that's a great question now you're you're probably a, a philosopher at heart because that's <laughs> the exactly right move when i say well no humor is reducible to cleverness the immediate question is well what do you mean by clever steve Right. This is why philosophers are so annoying. This is what <laughs> do. And so you're right. The heart of my view had to be working out what could be meant by cleverness. And I do it by reaching back all the way to Aristotle from the ancient Greeks. 
And he argues that in the case of ethics, that the key to understanding ethics is understanding the concept of virtues. So to be a good person is to be a virtuous person. And a virtuous person is someone who has the properties that allow you to be the person you could be, to actualize your potential. And so for Aristotle, there are certain properties you ought to have. And when you develop them, you improve your character. But what I argue is that if we take that idea out of ethics and put it into the study of knowledge, the fancy word is epistemology, we can talk about the properties of somebody with a really good mind. Maybe they're a good problem solver. Maybe they're well-read. Maybe they know a lot of different things, right? There are a whole lot of different virtues, cognitive virtues that we can assign to somebody who's smart or wise, right? And what I wanna argue is that cleverness is when you use one of those virtues, but you don't use it to actually do anything you just use it in an aesthetic way, in an artistic way. I'm not being clever to solve a problem. I'm just being clever on a stage to show you how clever I am. So when you use some sort of cognitive tool that would be useful in the world, but now you're using it not in the world, but on an artistic stage, that's what I think cleverness is. That, that almost, I'm almost hearing like the smarter you are though, the more clever you can be and the funnier you can be. <laughs> so my level of funny is only gonna get to be so much if that's, the, if that's the case. Well, but I think the notion of smart is so multi-dimensional that it isn't only book smart, right? You know, there are lots of ways to be smart. And so I think there are lots of ways to show cleverness. Okay. So I, yeah, I, I I don't want it to sound overly elitist that only the educated people are capable. No, anyone can be funny. There are funny people everywhere from every race, every class, every culture. But, you know, we know those people are funny and we know those people who aren't funny. We all have people like that. Yes. They try to tell it, they just murder it. <laughs> but what is it about the funny people? The ones who can come up with something and it's always, there's some twist. You know, Maybe they see something a different way. Maybe they can connect to things that we hadn't realized were connected or maybe just exaggerate. But that exaggeration has to, like a good caricature, like you might get drawn down there in a harbor, right? It, it has to look like the person in order to be a good caricature. Right, it kind of makes me think of the word wit. You need a quick wit. That kind of goes with cleverness. I know those two words to me kind of tie together in a way. That's actually what Aristotle does. He's, he, says, look, you can have no humor and be a bore. You can have too much and be a buffoon, but the person in the middle has wit. And that's <laughs> the way to be. There you go. Um, yeah, and I can kind of see where, intelli I mean, intelligence, what am I trying to say here? On a night when I've drank a lot, the next morning, I'm not as intelligent. I'm not as <laughs> quick-witted. I'm a little slower. <laughs> so there's a, a lot of things that can influence that. And, <laughs> and you see it in improv. Right, you know, part of improv is being able to quickly adapt, but another part of improv is a sort of emotional intelligence, right? It's yes and, you're working off of somebody, and you can have people who are very smart, very quick, but not really good improv artists because they're incapable of listening, of incorporating, of being, you know, sort of emotionally intelligent in developing the comic. So I think right. there are all sorts of intelligences. Got you. I mean, and yeah, there's a, being present in the moment, being able, like you said, being able to listen. That's such a huge part of improv. But anyone that out there is doing it, like me, it's you forget. You're trying to think of your next. You're, you're so afraid of what you're about to say next that you're not listening to anything the person's talking to you about. And that's when the scene shuts down. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. The great ones are just so open and playing off of each other and playing with each other. Yes. 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 Um, so, so this this theory it feeds into all different types of comedy i guess slapstick verbal uh visual i guess you can you can play it into any type of these these different forms of comedy i think that's right and that's actually one of the strengths what's interesting is philosophers we're these you know we're nerds of a certain kind and we love language and so virtually all of the the philosophy of humor tends to be about verbal humor 
tends to be about the structure of set up punchline jokes. But that's just a very small slice of, you know, the, the large umbrella that is humor. And there's some people who say, well, it's such a large umbrella that you have things that aren't even related to each other. You're gonna need different understandings of different pieces. I think I got one, we'll see. People think I don't, we argue. That's what philosophers do. <laughs> if we come to a final answer, I'm out of a job. I got to get real work. That's a bad thing. <laughs> I got you. I feel like you could argue at any point and take it in a different direction and be agreeing but disagreeing the whole way there. Am I making sense? <laughs> Let's hope that's true. I got two kids to get through college. This thing has to last at least another four years. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so leading on the, the cleverness part of it, there's, there's also got to be an aspect to like where you're born, your, your religion or, you know, your, your influences, like something might be witty and super clever, but if I was born halfway across the world, I might be offended by that. Well, I, I think you have two very different, both wonderful questions. One is, is humor cultural? And the second is, is offensive humor funny? And I think they're both really interesting questions. Well, it's, if we start with the first, the question is, is it cultural? And I think the answer is yes and no. So in one sense, we can find humor from other places, other times, still very funny. We have a joke book from uh, ancient Rome. So the first joke book is called Philagelos, and it's a collection of a couple hundred jokes from Roman times, although it's written in Greek. And the jokes sound like jokes you might even hear today. One is, you know, the chatty barber says to the customer, how would you like me to cut your hair? And the customer says, in silence. I mean, it's something you might get out of a Bazooka Joe comic. Right, right, right. I mean, right, right. It, it, it looks and sounds like the sort of joke we would tell. And so in that sense, I think you can look at humor around the world and still recognize it for the humor it is at the same time for particular jokes. So the, the structure may be universal. It may be something that evolved in the brain. There's a, a large community that looks at that sort of neuroevolutionary angle. How did we come to have humor as a species? Because it's a really weird thing. And so it would seem that it would be universal in that sense, in the sense that it's using a certain brain function to work. But at the same time, the trigger for particular jokes will often turn on background knowledge that you have to have. So if you want to understand a pun, you need to be fluent enough in the language to understand how this could mean two things. So did you hear about the quantum mechanical nightclub? It's called the H-bar. Most people don't find that joke the slightest bit funny. If you have a friend who's a theoretical physicist, he will recognize that in quantum mechanics, the main uh, constant is Planck's constant, which we represent by H, H divided by two pi, they call H bar. So, oh, the H bar. Okay. Jokes are never funny when you explain them because now you come to have both understandings. So you see the joke, but for the joke to trigger the psychological mechanisms, you had to have those both prior. So you're right that there is a cultural element to humor in that, you know, I may watch you know, a funny show from Indonesia and I won't get the humor, but what I will be able to pick up is, okay, that was a joke. I don't get it, but I at least recognize that it is a joke that people from that culture would understand. So is it cultural? And the answer is, well, yes and no. I, I you know, I, I didn't, I guess I never really related it to like, for instance, the seminar I said I gave last week was, it was at a pawn convention. I'm a pawnbroker. That's my other job. And uh, I cracked some jokes that nobody outside of the pawn industry would understand at all, but the pawn industry was cracking up, you know? So I, that's the same thing. I guess I never really brought those together. You know, you exactly. think a cultural is a much bigger thing than that, but in reality, the same thing. So that would make you a king amongst pawns. I, I, you know, I don't want to say that, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> was humor a survival tactic? I know most species we've evolved and most of the things we do is to survive, to procreate. So 
was humor ever a part of that? Like, um... that's actually a really interesting question because biologically, humor makes no sense at all. So you're right, evolutionarily, right? There are two selection pressures, right? One is natural selection, right? You have to be alive to pass your genes on, right? And the other is sexual selection, right? You have to have a date before you can pass your genes on, right? So some people have suspected, well, maybe humor is the second one, right? Because, you know, we find a sense of humor attractive, at least theoretically, it was hard in college to get a date. But biologically, when you look at the effects of humor, it's weird, right? Biologically, the coin of the realm is energy. You need energy, right? For all of your bodily functions, if you're trying to trap prey, if you're trying to make sure you're not prey and run away, right? You need energy. So the last thing you ever want to do is waste energy. But think about what happens when you find something funny. You laugh. I mean, you ever have just that belly laughs, you find something so funny, you just can't stop, you find it hard to breathe, you're stuck, and you can't think of anything, you're just doubled over in laughter. Mm -hmm. Biologically, that is the worst possible thing that could ever happen to you. You're now a sitting duck and you're just hemorrhaging energy. Why would this evolve into a species? This makes no sense biologically. It seems evolutionarily like humor should not happen. And so the question then is, well, why did it? And we see humor and reactions to humor the same all around the world. Not only that, but the body rewards you. In India, they have a, a practice called laugh yoga, where groups of people will get together. They'll start fake laughing, but that then rapidly turns into real laughter. And you'll have a bunch of 50 people not laughing at anything, but just all laughing together. Mm -hmm. And at the end, everybody just feels great. Because when you laugh, your brain releases all of these neurochemicals that just combat stress, that just do wonderful things for your physical and mental health. So, you know, I mean, humor may not be the best medicine, but it is a good one. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, why would we develop this when it seems evolutionarily to be harmful? There are really two views that try to explain it. One is that when we started, you know, way back when, when language just first sort of started evolving, we would, you know, human beings tend to be pack animals. We have family groups. And so we look out for each other. And when somebody would find uh, a sense, something that was, you know, dangerous, you know, a snake or, you know, a saber-toothed tiger, they would make a noise, early language, that would alert everyone else, there's danger. And the instant there's danger, now you get that, you know, flood of adrenaline, right? The, the deep old part of the brain triggers fight or flight instincts. And now you're using lots and lots of energy because you, you gotta be on high alert. And then when the danger has passed, they would need to give another signal, which would then allow all those chemicals to flush and the body to relax. And the thought is that that relaxation signal became the basis for humor, that there would have to be practical jokers amongst our ancient ancestors who realized they could make everybody nervous and then relax and, somebody smack him, but you could get that reaction. So that's one biological theory. The other is that what happens is the human brain has to react very quickly to stimuli. Think about something like just catching a ball. Somebody throws a ball at you. So my, my son's a baseball player and we'll go out and throw to keep his arm loose. And there are times when he'll throw over my head and I can reach up and catch. I'm not even looking at the ball, but somehow I've been able to mentally calculate what the trajectory would be and know where to put my hand. How does the brain do that so quickly? If we thought of the brain as a, a simple computer, it would have to calculate so much that it would never get the hand up in time. 
And so the second theory is that what the brain does is create what's called a mental space, which is an oversimplified model of reality that's so stripped down that we can make these calculations quicker because it's a much simpler fake model universe. The problem is because you simplify, you might oversimplify and leave out something important. So we need a second mental faculty that checks our model to make sure it's right in the right way. And when it finds an error, ah, you may have just saved your life. So we need a sort of reward for that. And that reward is neurochemical happy juice that makes us, ah, laugh because we found the error. And what we've been able to do, the argument is, is sort of short circuit that, that what jokes are, are these sort of mental worlds in which we embed an error, which we will then find sort of like Easter egg hunts. We put the nugget in there, we hide it a little bit so that we'll find it and then get the reward for having found the Easter egg. So those are the two theories as to how we came to have humor, despite the fact that biologically, it really makes zero sense. Right, it almost sounds like a, a coping mechanism or a way to, to deal with trauma or drama. It certainly developed into that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is one of the reasons why, right, when somebody's down, we try to tell them a joke. Because when you are laughing, what's really interesting is when you're laughing at something, you literally cannot think about anything else. You are just focused on that thing. It's a little bit like uh, when you have an itch, you scratch it. Why do you scratch? Well, here's also an interesting is that we have two sets of nerves, one for little, very gentle touch and another set for hard touch. When you scratch, you're taking a nerve that had been sending signals because of something light, something small, you're now sending the big signals which drown out the little ones. And so we can do the same thing emotionally when somebody has an emotional itch, right? There's something wrong, something making them sad. If you watch a funny movie, something makes you laugh. Now you can no longer, you can't focus on that while you're laughing at this. And so at least for that brief moment, you feel better. Right, I, I think that's why my, my hour of improv that I do with my group every week is my escape. Like I am not thinking about my stress at work. I could have just lost a billion dollars somewhere and I'm not thinking about that for that. <laughs> Well, then I might be crying, but because <laughs> <laughs> I would have been happy I had a billion dollars and then I would have. <laughs> so, was, was, was comedy ever used as a, as a weapon if it tires people out? <laughs> I mean, of course it is. Anyone who has ever spent any time on a third grade playground knows that humor can be used as a weapon. And, that, and that's what I think is really, really interesting about humor is that yeah, we do use it to get laughs, but we use it for so much more. Humor is an, in, it, it's a Swiss army knife. There's nothing you can't use it for. So, you know, I think it's pretty obvious. I use a lot of humor in the classroom. And I do that for a number of reasons, right? Not just because I want my students to laugh. You know, I mean, there's a difference between, you know, the comedy club and a classroom. And in, in a comedy club, you have drunk college students in the classroom, you've hung over college students. But the idea is that when I make the jokes in the classroom, it sends a signal to the class. Oh, it's okay to relax here, which again, neurologically puts them in a better place to learn. Well, if the professor just made a fool of himself by saying something funny, I'll ask this question that I don't have to be so nervous thinking I'll be stupid because look, I'm not gonna be as stupid as the professor and he's the professor. Right? It, it may say, you know, look, there's a hierarchy. And by making a self-deprecating joke, I'm now saying I'm like you. So, you know, humor can be used as a tool both positively, but it can also be used very aggressively. You know, an insult delivered with a joke has that extra bite, that extra sting. So yeah, you can certainly, you know, if I make a, a joke at your uh, cost, you feel it a little bit extra. And that I think gets us back to your question of offensiveness, 
because jokes can be used as weapons and they really can hurt right. if they're really clever right they can they can almost hurt more than just saying outright what you're trying to what you're trying to insult somebody with yes yeah. you got people laughing at the insult yeah it's it's double exactly and so humor is a really fascinating human tool that just it does so much work. You know, one of the most important humor researchers is actually in Baltimore at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, which is my alma mater, Go Retrievers. Uh, and he pointed out, he did research on laughter. And he showed that uh, most laughter doesn't uh, come from anything funny that if you watch children laugh, they're always laughing at something and they're having a hilarious time. But if you watch adults, most of it is what they call uh, social lubricant. We laugh in order to sort of send a social signal that, you know, it's okay, I'm not dangerous to you. And what's fascinating is that if you look say just at gender, when two women talk, they will tend to laugh at the same rate. When two men talk, they will tend to laugh at the same rate. When a man and a woman talk, women tend to laugh more than men. Women often are doing it, not because they find the guy funny, but because they're trying to grease his ego. <laughs> Which works. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it does. And that's what's so interesting. If you look at singles ads, there's a lot that say, you know, looking for someone with a sense of humor. But when you ask men what they mean by a sense of humor, it's someone who will find my jokes funny. When you ask women, it tends to be someone who will make me laugh. Right. Which is unfortunate because you really need both. And I mean, hopefully we are getting to a place now, you know, what's interesting is 20 years ago, female comedians were really few and far between. Now you're really starting to see you know, a huge generation of, you know, female comedians who are just wonderful. So as a, as a computer guy, as a tech guy, compute, can computers figure out, can they write a joke? Can, can, <laughs> is, is, it, is there a formula at this point that can, a computer can figure out? That's such a great question. I actually have been working with a, a colleague of mine in computer science and a student we share who's a computer science major philosophy minor on exactly this question. For the last 20 years, a very active research program in computer humor, right? The idea is we, we, we had this question about artificial intelligence. You know, there's what we call the, the easy problem and the hard problem. So the easy problem is, can we get a computer to learn, to mimic the sort of way that the human mind functions and to, to do things that are self-corrected? And the answer to that is yes. Anyone who has social media, isn't it weird how they always know what to advertise to you? They learn about you. There are algorithms that can take in information and do what we do in learning. Mm -hmm. But then there's the hard problem. And that's the question of consciousness. Can a computer ever be conscious? And one line is that we could only have computer consciousness when we have a computer that can do certain kinds of things that the human brain does. Yeah, we calculate and a you know, computer can calculate, but it has to follow directions, follow instructions, follow its programs. We're creative, right? Mm -hmm. So the way my friend, the computer scientist puts it is, when you give a computer lemons, you get lemons. When you give a human lemon, you get lemonade. We can do something new and wonderful with it. And so if we're ever going to have a conscious computer, it would have to be creative. Well, what sort of creativity are we looking at? Well, if you go back to Alan Turing, the first person to really ask these questions, one of the things he said is, well, something that can make jokes. And so there have been people for the last 20 years who have been trying to create joke generators. And at this point, it's hit or miss. So we have ones that figure out the structure of certain kinds of jokes. 
that have an understanding of language in the same way that say your word processor does when it corrects your grammar. So it knows what kind of words should go where. It knows words that are ambiguous that have multiple meanings. And so they come up with sort of cheesy dad jokes. They're not tremendously funny on a regular basis. Are you insulting dad jokes? That's what I live with the dad jokes. I am a father. Trust me, we live sort of out in the country now. And every time we pass, you know, a truck that has dried grass on it and bales, I'll say, hey, and the kids will look up and they'll realize, oh, hey. So yes, believe me, I am a connoisseur of the dad joke. They're kind of sore of my dad jokes too. But, you know, that's basically the level we've gotten the computer to. We haven't gotten a computer Robin Williams yet. That probably would be the tipping point. Right, right. Well, well see if we get there. It's amazing <laughs> with. Uh... <laughs> if you can't show up for your improv group, you just send your cell phone. Oh my God. <laughs> you know, there's some days where <laughs> that stage fright kicks in, and that'd be great if I toss my cell phone onto the stage. <laughs> <laughs> stage fright is such a weird thing. I did actually, I, I did a show in Baltimore. And they had the speaker set up behind and heard my voice. And we all think we sound like James Earl Jones until we hear what we really sound like. <laughs> and I had stage fright kick in. And what I did act interestingly to deal with it is I took an improv class here at Gettysburg College. <laughs> and so, you know, I think it's, it's, it's one way to certainly deal with that problem. Yeah, I've said on this podcast a number of times, it's the main reason I took improv was to get over my stage fright. I mean, it, it brings back, of course, that classic Jerry Seinfeld joke where he, he says that the number one fear is public speaking. Number two is death, which means that at a funeral, most people would rather be in the coffin than giving the eulogy. <laughs> and, you know, it, it, it is odd that in a certain sense, so little is actually on the line. Mm -hmm. And yet, we do find that so nerve wracking. You know, and that's so key because so little is on the line. Like yeah. nobody's going to remember. It's, I don't know if you play golf, but it's like when you'll play golf, you're so worried about your next stroke and like, nobody's going to remember how you hit that ball. Like you're the only one who cares. <laughs> exactly. And yet somehow we ramp it into everything. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's fascinating. We're we're strange beings. <laughs> yes, we are. I, we put so much importance on ourselves, I think, and everyone else is putting so much importance on themselves. So they they don't have time to. I think that's exactly right. Is that we we get caught within our own subjectivity. We get caught in our own experience of the world that we we make it the only thing that is, and what both interactions with other people and what humor itself does in a certain sense is decenter us from the universe. And that's always a good thing. I think, you know, love does that. Parenthood does that. Friendship does that. All of these deep human relationships really sort of remove you from being the center of the universe. And maybe humor is just a reflection of that in a certain way. Were you, were you, was humor always a part of your life? Did you, were you born telling jokes coming out? And was it something you, you always knew you, you, you liked doing and you were going to do? That's right. I, can't, I was just born today and boy, is my umbilical cord tired. Uh, I, you know, I was a comedy nerd from very early on. Yeah, my, my father, you know, loved comedy and I found his comedy albums when I was young. Some I, shouldn't have listened to but others really inspired me and yeah i i really have loved comedy my whole life you know i also a, a science nerd growing up and that's sort of the direction i went i you know double majored in college in both physics and philosophy and went on to become a philosopher of physics but once i got tenure which is great because then i could do whatever i want you know i had been you know, when I turned 30, which I won't tell you how many years ago that was, yesterday, I decided, you know what, this is something I've never done. So I tried stand up and, you know, for about five years on and off, just amateur stuff, you know, open mic nights. And then I found the philosophy of humor and realized 
what the comedians that I was working with were saying about humor was very different from what the philosophers were saying. And so at that point, I started playing not only in philosophy of science, but philosophy of humor, because what the theorists were saying didn't seem to match what was happening in the comedy clubs. So when you work at a comedy club, the comedians are always sitting in the back so that the audience can be up front. So they're always back at the bar and they are always judging each other. It's a very judgmental community. But what interested me, what surprised me is I thought, okay, the purpose of a comedian is to get the crowd laughing. And the more laughs, the better the comedian. But what was interesting is the other comedians were judging every joke, but it wasn't the jokes that got the biggest laughs that necessarily got the most praise. Sometimes they disapproved of jokes that got huge laughs. And other times a joke would fall flat, but they'd be like, that was a good line. And so it started me wondering, what could it be that they're actually looking at? What is it that the, you know, the people committed to this art form treat as the positive artistic acts? And that's actually where the whole idea of cleverness came from, because I realized, oh, there are some jokes that are cheap. You know they'll get jokes, right? Freud talks about, you know, the majority of our jokes being either dirty jokes or ethnic jokes. Yeah, and you can get cheap laughs with certain triggers that you know are gonna work, but to an artist, to, to a comedian who's actively working, they're like, oh, you took the easy way out. Mm -hmm. Other times it's like, okay, that almost got there, but I see what you're doing. That's really quality work. And so it was in the comedians judging each other that I started to wonder what is actually going on with really good comedy. Right, I, I mean, I relate to that, but we're, we're not judging the improv community, but <laughs> when you end a scene with a dirty joke of some sort, you know, it's, audience loves it, but we all, we all know we just- cheap. Exactly. <laughs> cheap and cheesy. Yeah, well, sometimes you need it because you gotta get <laughs> that scene. So you're... <laughs> this is true. <laughs> gotta keep it in the arsenal. Um, <laughs> so did you, did you have jokes written? How did you- Absolutely. So it was what's called a bringer show, which means if you bring five people, you get five minutes. If you bring six, so there's you know, a, a cover charge at the door. If you bring six people, you get six minutes. And so I was going to write a seven minute set, which is usually for whatever reason, the number you start with. And so I wrote and it took me six months and I honed and I crafted and I got up, you know, I had friends, family, coworkers, former students, you know, it was my 30th birthday. So this was sort of the, the party. So you packed the house. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I got up there. I did my seven minutes. I felt good. And I thought, okay, check it off the bucket list. <laughs> but I caught a little bit of the bug and started rolling after that. But, you know, comedy is done in bars. And, you know, after a while, you just get a little too old to be out that late and have to get up for work the next day. <laughs> right, right. I understand that. I, I can't imagine getting up there by myself and and telling jokes that you've just written without testing them, without knowing, because so often I even know when I do my improv or the seminars, the thing I've said that I think is going to be the joke isn't the joke. It'll be the line after that was just the throwaway line that I didn't even think was... <laughs> No, that's absolutely true. And for me, because I mean, I stand up and talk in front of people all day. I'm a teacher. I thought this is going to be easy. I just do what I do at work only here. And it wasn't working. And I found myself getting nervous, even though I was in front of, you know, it's a bar. It's largely college students. And I thought, this is so strange. And at first I thought, well, in part, what's happening is there's a power inversion in the classroom. I'm in control, so the students are going to laugh because, well, they have to. In a bar, no longer am I the authority figure. Now the audience has the power, and I'm asking them to give me the grade. And that sort of inversion of going from, you know, being the king to being the subject really was 
a radical change. And a little bit of stage fright, I started carrying a red pen in my pocket, thinking maybe the thing that gives me power in the classroom will work here. Yeah, it didn't work either. It was a good idea. Uh, I found, you know, my jokes weren't landing. A former student came to see me. And afterwards he said, you know, I see you up there and all I see is a college professor. I thought, boy, this is not good because authority figures are scary, not funny. And so I had to change, you know, I, I would have a sport coat and jeans, just sort of the eighties picture of a stand-up comedian. And after that, I started, you know, I would, you know, let my hair down. I would dress much more casually, try to seem less threatening. It did a little bit better, but no, well, I still have my day job, so. <laughs> Mostly about the jokes. It's mostly about uh, <laughs> <laughs> start blaming it on everything else. And <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> where can where can people find you? Uh, well, right now I'm in my office. Okay, so uh, what's your address? <laughs> what's your <home> address? <laughs> I'm at Gettysburg College, so you can find me on their website. I also have done uh, several lecture series for the teaching company's great courses. So if you want to see me in action, I have four different sets of uh, lectures that you could find there. Okay. And is this the class that you teach? Take my course, please. The philosophy of humor. Is that something that you just have to be at the college to take? Or is that something that... Um... Nope. That one is available through the teaching company. I teach a version of it here at the college. I also teach a class called From Tevye to Seinfeld, 20th Century Jewish Comedy. And I have a, a new intro level course called Stand Up Philosophy, the Ethics and Aesthetics of Humor. So, you know, it's great. I get to teach whatever I want and I teach a lot of comedy. That's fine. It sounds like you've, you've, you've earned it though. <laughs> you've gotten there. And again, I know you didn't come on here to push anything. So I'm just trying to. <laughs> no, but I can't say I don't appreciate it. I got two kids to put through college. <laughs> there you go. But thank you so much. I, I reached out to you and you you said yes. So I was excited. And my small Timor is very much looking forward to, to listening to this episode. So hey, this was a blast, man. Thank you so much. Again, this was a Dweebs Global production. They give free mentorship help. Uh, around the world, anything from resume writing to mental health and everything in between. Uh, over 500 mentors ready to help every language, every country. Uh, please, dweebsglobal.org. They're there to help. So thank you.